Les Williams has a story to tell. And it's not just the amazing fact that at 55, he went back to college and earned a law degree from Stanford University. When Les was a young man, he was one of the original Tuskegee Airmen. And he flew B-25 bombers, just like this baby, back in World War II. The 332nd Fighter Group were known as the Red Tails and they gained a well-earned reputation as skilled combat pilots flying P-47 Thunderbolts and P-51 Mustangs for bomber support over Europe. They were also known for being courageous and relentless in the air. At the height of World War II, a group of highly motivated African-American pilots in the original 99th Fighter Group flew some of the most challenging and daunting missions of the European theater. They were known as the Tuskegee Airmen, and their story is more than just about individual heroism, but rather about men who were able to prevail over discrimination and American prejudice and the Nazi war machine. Except for our uniforms and uh, the fact that we knew we were doing something very helpful to improve our race, we knew that we were going to have to put up with a whole lot of stuff, uh, which we did. And uh, so that was the overall atmosphere throughout the training. 89-year-old Les Williams was one of those young pilots that went through the training in Tuskegee, Alabama. The military was segregated at the time and discrimination was rampant, but the men who wanted to fly somehow endured to earn their wings. It was bad, and uh, they even told us that we weren't all going to be here when the bell rings. And so the training was very difficult. They had us do things I don't think that, had, that every white cadet had to go through. But that was very helpful because it made us really try to be the best. And we told each other we're going to be the best. And we stuck with that and we helped each other. Les Williams grew up in San Mateo, one of the very few black families in the area. He graduated from high school at 15 and spent a year trying to work as a dancer and as an entertainer before he returned home and graduated from San Mateo Junior College. Eventually, when World War II broke out and Williams, who'd always wanted to fly, was drafted, he spent his time in the Quartermaster Corps, as did most black troops at the time, loading and unloading ships. Luck, talent, and timing intervened, and after he passed a number of tests, the kid from San Mateo was on the train and headed for Tuskegee, Alabama to become a pilot. He was in, however, for a significant culture shock. So the first night was okay. Everything was Afro-American. But the next day, I became under the uh, supervision of white officers and they were they were mean and I think I'm being uh, nice to them they were mean and that encompasses everything that you can attach to the word mean and so from then on throughout the cadet corps I was I was the n-word which we heard every day and no matter how we had to go through nine months of this that training involved nine months training. And so uh, we had an awful time with the white officers. They would treat us like slaves, but we, would, we made it a point to, that we were gonna make it in spite of all this problem. And uh, that if we kept our eye on that goal, we'd make it. And we had taught that to everybody that was there and they were very supportive. Despite the hardships and the brutal prejudice, the men went on to earn their wings. There were 996 original airmen. They included pilots, bombardiers, and navigators, and more than 10,000 black men and women who served as support personnel. Williams went on to solo, and it looked like he was headed to Europe to become a fighter pilot. However, in aerobatics training, he lost consciousness twice while doing loops in AT6s. Despite excellent fitness reports and high standings in his class, he thought he was going to be forced to resign. Lady Luck, however, wasn't through just yet with Les Williams. There was a fortunate event that's happening in, in uh, Washington. The War Department said, well, these African-American pilots are doing so well in Europe, we ought to let them try their hand at flying bombers. Not the four-engine bombers like the B-14 and the B-17, but an attack bomber. And they chose uh, the B-25 for us to train in. And uh, 
I jumped at the chance when they asked for volunteers, who wants to be in the first group of bomber pilots ever trained in the United States? And I said, I do. And uh, that was that was the most uh, the most primary coincidence that ever happened to me in my whole life. It just happened at the right time. And uh, so I got into the B-25 training and I've happily learned that they can't do loops. <laughs> so uh, that's how I got into the first bombing class. Under the command of Colonel Benjamin O. Davis, pilots of the 332nd Fighter Group went on to escort numerous bombing raids. Flying escort for heavy bombers, the Tuskegee Airmen flew more than 15,000 sorties, destroyed over 300 German aircraft, and earned an astonishing 150 flying crosses, awarded for heroism or extraordinary achievement while participating in an aerial flight. One of the most unusual secrets of the war was that the Red Tails were all black fighter pilots. Not until after the war ended and people started to come back did we find out how much the Red Tails contributed to the morale of the white bomber crews. Because one of their uh, assignments, one of the Red Tails assignments was to escort bombers over their targets, over the Ploesti oil fields or over Hungary, or over Germany, or over Italy. And uh, they did so well that uh, they became wanted by these bomber pilots. They said, we want the Red Tails to protect us because they don't leave our formation. They see that we get to where we're going. While the majority of the Tuskegee Airmen became fighter pilots, Williams waited and waited around so that more black navigators and bombardiers could be trained so they could ship out as B-25 crews to Europe. However, the war ended before Williams could ever fly combat missions. Nevertheless, he had more than his share of near-close calls while flying. I did have a fire in flight one night, and we have a crew of five, and I was flying over Illinois someplace, and the fire in one engine came up, and uh, we could put it out. There's a way of putting it out, which we did right away, but that made that engine useless. So we were, had to fly on this single engine, which uh, we had to hope would not get overheated or not get overtaxed and uh, go out on this too. But we did find a, a, an airfield over Illinois, Scott Field, and so we landed there without incident. And uh, so I said, boy, that's, that's B-25 is a beautiful plane. By the end of the war in 1945, the Tuskegee Airmen had lost 66 pilots killed in action or accidents, and another 32 pilots downed and captured POWs. Williams would eventually leave the military as a captain in the Air Corps, return home, and graduate from Stanford University on the GI Bill. He would go on to raise a family and run an extremely successful dance studio in his hometown. Some men never back away from challenges, and Williams returned to college at age 55 and graduated from Stanford Law School to become a practicing attorney. In 1948, President Harry Truman enacted Executive Order Number 9981, directing equality of treatment and opportunity in all of the United States Armed Forces, which in time led to the end of racial segregation in the U.S. military. The lasting legacy of the Tuskegee Airmen and Les Williams is one of heroism and sacrifice for men who earned the right to fly and fight for their own country.